Hello, my name is Kevin Alcuni, and I am Lee Bryan here in the Exploration and Creativity Department of the Los Angeles Public Library, and I'm here to welcome you to today's LA Made, Rethinking Wines, a Culture of Flavor and Feel. Before we move forward with today's program, we would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as traditional caretakers of this land, because it is on this land that we are so lucky to work, teach, and learn as a community. We'd also like to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, our Library Foundation, and our behind the scenes staff for helping bring the LA May programs to you virtually. LA May focuses on the diverse landscape of Los Angeles, highlighting the immense artistic and performance talent that has developed in the course of the city's eclectic history. If you'd like to see more of our amazing programs, please visit our online calendar at lapo.org slash events, right there. I missed it. And for our LA Made programs, visit lapl.org slash LA Made. Our website also has blog posts and video links that highlight the library's diverse resources and upcoming programs. So check it out. But now on to today's program, Rethinking Wines, a culture of flavor and feel. Writing about wine and wine education have tended to prioritize a British American perspective, but today a greater diversity of voices are finally being listened to. Drawing upon her background as an Inuk woman, Elaine Chacon Brown, one of the few indigenous wine reviewers in America, will show how honoring and respecting our cultural differences can help us enjoy a greater appreciation of our own lives, including the rich flavor and feel offered by both food and wine. Elaine serves as a writer, speaker, educator, and illustrator of wine. Amongst her many writing awards includes Wine Communicator of the Year in 2020, Prior to her career in wine, Elaine was a philosophy professor specializing in ethics and social politics. Now let's welcome to our LA Made stage, Elaine Chacon Brown. Yay! What's up? Woo -woo. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to see you. Yeah, what's up? Long time well, no see. Well, I was thinking, Kevin, you and I have known each other for... 15 since, years? Since 2004, I think. We, oh, yeah, we you're met. right. I spent a, yeah, I spent a summer in LA and we did a bunch of rooftop parties that, <laughs> that year. <laughs> yeah. So right on. I'm I'm ready to uh I'm ready to jump in. I have I have my little cup that I'm gonna break I out. Could you please demonstrate for everybody All the right, cup so that you're going you, to taste yeah, wine from? I'm gonna taste wine from this guys because I didn't get a fancy glass. So it's awesome. It's perfect. It's a travel camping cup yeah. that collapses. Can you show us the collapsed version again, too? Okay. Yeah. You know, just, you know, don't be jealous, public. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you can, you too can have a fancy wine glass like this guy. I don't know well, I feel embarrassed that I'm like, look like all serious now. So, because I have, I'm doing it <laughs> this, but I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm very serious about wine. <laughs> It's okay. You know what? I, th I think one of the things that we're going to try and show is people can enjoy wine however they want. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to pour some in now. Okay. Um, so as a, as a historical tidbit, it's um, a lot of fun to know that actually at one point LA was actually the biggest wine producing region in California. So it, there were vineyards planted all over what is now downtown LA um, all along the LA River in the 1800s and the early 1900s, LA was just, um, it was actually a vine city, a city of vines. And it's a really fascinating history to learn about, to read about. I recommend everybody there in LA could, um, could check that out. I, I should have actually um, checked to see if, if there's actually a book called City of Vines and it's about the history of wine growing in LA. I should have oh. checked to see if it was in your catalog. That would be a great um, book for people to check out. It's just really fun and surprising. I think a lot of people don't realize that history of, of that incredible city. What what time period would that have been in? Yeah, so Vines went into what's now the L.A. area in the very, very end of the 1700s, start of the 1800s. And yeah. then the... Um, the you know, so this that happened via Spanish missionaries that came up through what is now Mexico, but then um, kind of the 1820s, the mission era in what's now LA collapsed and a lot of the vines were left untended. But then um, the first people to commercially plant vines outside of the church, there was a French settler started a vineyard in LA 
Um, some people tried to take over some of the vineyards that were originally planted by the church, but yeah. also planted their own. And then by the end of the 1800s and going into the early 1900s, there were vines, like I said, all over downtown LA. Prohibition hit though um, in the early 1900s. And uh, a lot of those, by, by then a lot of the vines were being pulled out so that planted houses could be planted instead. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't. Vincent. Yeah, I don't think people associate Los Angeles with like wine growing. Uh, and I guess because it's is it is it not really a wine growing city? Well, no, it's an asphalt growing city actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it grows it, but it only produces but if, it. Yeah. If you look, um, but if you look at kind of the old city emblems, there's actually there are vines around the edges and things like that. So it's just uh, a fun tidbit. This is this is an unofficial part of. Okay, so everyone today. just yeah. take it in unofficially, <laughs> yeah. unofficially listen, please. Um, so the other thing too, Diane's letting us know that City of Vines is in the library and um, is a library resource for the LA Public Library. And I definitely recommend it. It's a really fun read. And like I said, unexpected. A lot of people, like you just said, Kevin, don't associate LA with. Yeah, I, I had no idea. So that's, that's a cool little unofficial tidbit. Yeah. Okay, so. What I want to talk about for a few minutes before I get you to use your camping travel cup uh -huh. to drink wine from is um, oh no, just... it's leaking. I have to drink some already. Sorry. Uh -oh. Pull it really like you got to. I'm trying. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, public. My my cup is leaking. Uh, Di right. Maybe Diane can run another cup option over for you or something. All right. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I, uh... Okay. okay, so be care I think I really think that accordion style cup. You have to pull the accordion very All right. tight. I'm you know? gonna I'm gonna have some of this. Have and then that. I'm going to. All right, but um, then I'm gonna pretend that see, I didn't have it. Here comes Here's, here's my boss. Thank you, boss. Oh, <laughs> all right. Thank you. All right. Okay, these great. Are regular. Um, right okay, so what I want to talk about today is um, what we can actually learn about ourselves from the process of tasting wine, and um, and then how that exploration can help us rethink wine too for wine professionals. So um, I know it's a mixed audience. A lot of the people that are joining us aren't in, don't work in wine at all, mm -hmm. but I ended up getting messages from a few colleagues that um, they will be watching. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> my, the wine professionals will be here too. So, um, but yeah, so what I want to talk about is like what we can learn about ourselves um, from wine tasting and what that can then help us better understand about wine. Okay. Um, cool. And so just to start with, like, the truth is I have this very weird job. Like my job is literally to taste wine and then talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like imagine like that's literally what I do professionally. I taste wine and then I talk about it. You know, I used to um, wine tasters, just to clarify for people that think we drink all day, we actually spit the wine out when we're doing it professionally. So I used mm -hmm. to say, oh, I drink and spit for a living. <laughs> um, but the truth is I drink spit and then talk about it for a living. And <laughs> So if you look at um, kind of the tradition of wine tasting, basically when I say, oh, I talk about it, what I mean is that my job is to get really good at describing the wine after I taste it. Mm -hmm. And so traditionally, the way that we do this is we start very simply and we say, okay, well, let's start with the fruits, you know, so this kind of wine is made just literally just from fermenting grapes and turning it into wine. We're mm -hmm. going to, I'm, I love this wine and we're going to talk about it more in a little bit, but, but any kind of reg, what we tend to think of as wine is made from fermenting grapes. But then when we taste the wine and we describe it, we start by saying, well, what fruit flavors do I taste in it? So it's not that, the way we describe the wine and all the flavors we talk about tasting literally went into the winemaking itself. It's that wine is this remarkable thing in that when you ferment grapes, the flavors transform in this incredibly complex way that allow us to taste all these other things, even though they're not literally in the glass. So as an example, you know, traditionally with wine tasting, we start with, well, what kinds of fruits do I taste? Mm -hmm. And okay. the the traditional um, kind of way to think about the types of fruits we taste is say, okay, well, let's start with citrus fruits. What kind of citrus fruits do we taste? Um, what kind of orchard fruits do we taste? So notice that would be cultivated tree fruits. Okay. So like apple and pear. And then what, or, you know, 
are there any tropical fruits? If so, what tropical fruits do we taste? So, so pineapple, um, papaya would be examples of tropical fruits. Uh -huh. So, <clears throat> so, um, for example, in white wines, it's really common to have a strong lemon presence again, just in experience, not literally in the, in the glass, but we we'll often say, Oh, I taste a lot of lemon. You know, you and I have been lucky enough to drink champagne together. Mm -hmm. And and so traditionally in a, in a white champagne, it would be like, oh, my gosh, there's so much lemon. And then I get a lot of apple. Right. So I'd be saying, okay. oh, there's a citrus and fruit and, a, and an orchard fruit. But now if you keep pushing into how we tend to do this, one of the things that happens is at some point people will say things like, oh, I get a lot of exotic spices. Hmm. Um, or then we'll have this idea, again, of tree fruits, like the orchard fruits, but we'll say, well, what counts as a tree fruit? And they'll be like, oh, you know, apples and pears, maybe peaches and nectarines. But a colleague of mine, um, Miguel, who um, lives in New York and leads an amazing wine list at um, a restaurant called Pinch Chinese, one of the things that he's written about and pointed out is, well, what about tamarind? Because it's a tree fruit. Hmm. But when we're doing traditional wine tasting, we're not talking about that sort of thing. We're assuming only certain kinds of fruits count. Oh, I got you. Yeah, right. But also this idea of exotic spices. Well, exotic to whom? Oh, right. <laughs> right? So notice what's happening is there's implicitly in the descriptions we take for granted when we talk oh, about wine... Mm -hmm. We're taking our own local experience and acting like it's universal. Gotcha. So when you ask, well, where did that even come from? It turns out actually most people that are trained professionally in wine tasting, they're, they, without even realizing it, they're being trained into having a British American centered perspective. Oh, yeah, yeah. But notice as soon as you say exotic spices, you're centering that British American perspective as right. And right. you're implying that the whole rest of the world with their exotic spices are different and, and maybe weird or other, right? Right. Not normal, not right. common to us. Right. So um, one of the reasons that this has really become part of the conversation from the perspective of wine tasting now is because um, wine tasting as a profession, so the weird job that I have, you know, where I taste wine and then have to describe it, it's become a global profession, a global practice. People all over the world are being trained on how to taste wine, except what we've realized is without thinking about it, we've taken this British American perspective and put it all over the globe as if it's what's right and normal. Right, right. So, um, so does that make sense, though, just as a starting place? Oh, for sure. I mean, the idea that, like, uh, if I'm not familiar with it, then it's exotic. And, uh, yeah, kind of having that uh, impromptuer upon, like, the different ways to describe it, it totally makes sense. Yeah. And so, I mean, what? but now if we step back from wine tasting, one of the things we can realize is that a lot of us, when we're just talking with each other, we inadvertently do similar sorts of things. Right. Hmm. Where like, again, that example of exotic. Well, wh wait a minute. We're assuming it's exotic because it's not co from cold, wet, rainy, dark London. Right. It was brought by boat or something from a really far away place. That's exotic in my mind. Right. But notice again how by saying that I'm inadvertently pushing away and making strange the thing I'm pointing to by using that word. Does that right. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, I think it's just a, I think it's a really cool perspective because it's something I don't think people really think about. And to kind of highlight it, um, I think in this time and age, I think it's um, it's important and it's a, just a way to broaden people's perspectives on how they kind of think about wine tasting and kind of maybe the terminology that they're using and kind of broadening like um, some of the words that they use. Yeah. Well, and part of what I'm want to bring out as we keep talking is just the point that we can all think about how we're talking with each other and how we're listening with oh, each uh -huh. other, you know? And so, so just, you know, to continue this conversation, let's kind of set that the wine tasting aside for a second. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you, you've met my kid, Rachel, and mm -hmm. Rachel is um, 22 now, but when they were growing up, 
when they were a little kid, you know, it's a common thing. Like little kids don't like vegetables or something. Little kids hate lima beans. Like there's all these things we assume little kids don't like. Right. And as parents, we have to make decisions about, well, how are we going to approach this? So um, I put a lot of thought into this and I, without really realizing it, as a parent, my interest was in really helping my kid be curious. Mm. And I, and it turned out that how I encouraged them to interact with food was one of the ways I was able to instill a curiosity about the world into their experience with the world. And so Rachel and I had, when Rachel was little, we had two rules about food. One, and I'll talk about both of them, but first I'll talk about the first one. The first crucial rule was that no matter what's in front of you, you have to take it twice. Taste no. it twice. <laughs> and, okay. um, and that if, if after tasting it twice, Rachel didn't really honestly didn't like it, then it was okay for them not to eat it. Right. But it was not in any way acceptable, no matter how strong the first reaction was, to not taste it again. And oh. so the so the rule was that okay you taste the you know if you haven't had it before you taste it once and then you set it aside you wait a little bit you know you take a breath wait a little bit and then you taste it again and the second time is when you really pay attention mm -hmm. and you hang out with it you eat it you think about how it tastes and um, and then swallow it and even after that you pause for a little bit and then you decide if you like it. So the point of the practice was you don't know if you like something until you take the time to taste it twice. Uh -huh. right. And so, um, and it turned out like I had, had, you know, when Rachel was, you know, we started this when Rachel was really little, just starting to eat food kind of thing. And, and it, and I just like stuck to my guns and was like, no, you have to taste it twice, <laughs> you know, stand up to the, to the little kid protests. And it turned out like now, this has become like a life rule for Rachel. And yeah. part of what I, um, part of the thing that's important about this is like, it's not just true with food. It's actually when we're presented with something new, if it's genuinely new, we don't know if we like it. And uh -huh. it actually goes back to a kind of survival instinct that we resist new things because we're protecting ourselves. And so we have a kind of innate automatic, automatic response to like push away something new. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is that um, it's really important to remember we have these innate responses, but we have to choose how do we want to engage with the thing itself, in this case, the food. Right. And so, um, you know, we can, com we can commit to taste it twice. And so as a wine taster, I actually, I was just at a, a professional conference and um, it was three full days of, of tasting wine and spitting all day. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and I actually, um, just day before yesterday, had this experience uh, where any any wine geeks that might be um, watching, I was tasting an Ermanoff 2004 Norton. So this is actually a, a hybrid grape based wine. Um, so rather than the traditional variety, it was a, it's a pretty unusual variety that it is not commonly talked about in mainstream wine circles. But uh, and it was also grown in Missouri. And Missouri, like if you think about which you know parts of the world where you hear about wines being grown, mm -hmm. Missouri is not really at the top of the list, right? Sure, I didn't realize so, it was even on the list. Well, and so the truth is, I had never had a wine made from Norton before. Mm -hmm. um, I'd had a wine made in Missouri before, but not in a long time. And, um, and I had never had a Missouri wine made from Norton that was as old as that. And I literally, I, I, um, they handed me the glass and I was, su I was super interested, but still my first reaction, I did this and I went, <laughs> like, oh. right away, did that. like my, everything in me was like, ah, I don't want that. You know, like, it was so strange that I immediately resisted it. And then I had to remind myself, oh, right. I have to take it, taste it twice, right? So I did the whole thing I taught my kid to do. And I like took a pause and I like, <laughs> you know, like took a breath and like looked around and, you know, 
uh, realize like everybody to, you know, make the face. And then I went back and I um, smelled it again. And I actually realized I was really impressed by the wine. Yeah. That it is totally unusual, but that actually it was very compelling. It was really interesting. It is totally different than a wine I've tasted before, hmm. but it was well worth exploring. And so the reason I want to talk about that is because I had to make a choice to, to taste past that first reaction. Oh, wow. If we think about this ethically, this is the kind of reminder that we can all take with us, not just in wine tasting, oh. but in our interactions with each other and our interactions with things we encounter in the world. We're always seeing new things interacting with new things. And we have to remember that we're trained in a way, our bodies are built in a way to revolt against or resist new things as a survival mechanism. Right. But we can actually ask ourselves, well, how do I want to engage with the world? And if we simply remember, well, taste it twice, <laughs> even if that's not literal. Right we can bring that as a practice. And really what I'm talking about is not less about taste and more about curiosity. Okay. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? Oh, for sure. I mean, what was the story I was telling you the other day? Like, um, I'm pretty new to wine drinking. Like I didn't drink wine. Like I almost want to say up until like the pandemic started and then I just decided to try it. And the phrase I kept going to was, uh, I don't know if I like this, but I'm going to keep drinking it. <laughs> and so yeah. my, Euphrania finds that amusing as well. So, um, yeah. Well, because I, notice if you, if you really hated it, you wouldn't keep drinking it. I don't know about that. Oh, okay. Know. Maybe that's about you. <laughs> if it's in the cup, if it's in the cup, it's, uh, it's going down the gullet. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, that, maybe, maybe that is more about me. Right. Um, <laughs> Well, so, um, but then what I'm, what I'm talking about though, with this idea of tasting wine and this experience of tasting it twice, again, the point is to, I'm making a choice to be curious for sure. And I raised my kid in, in order to encourage them to be curious. Yeah. And, and so when we, again, step back from wine and consider this idea of taste it twice. Another way to put the same practice to describe the same practice is to say, we need to practice the pause. Uh, okay. And so the idea is, again, this is kind of an ethical comportment an ethical choice we can make in how we engage with each other and how we engage with the world around us, including in wine. Right. And what we do is simply insert the pause. We practice the pause. So in the case of tasting, you have your first response. You or if you teach yourself this, you already know it's new to me. I, I'm going to have a strong reaction or I'm going to have some unpredictable reaction because mm -hmm. it's new. Okay, cool. Now insert the pause, which means take a breath, kind of get your head around the fact that now I'll decide what I think. And then you taste it again. Right. So, but the idea is you insert the pause. And the point, the point I'm trying to get at here is that we are, there's so much volatility in social interactions these days. And the truth is a lot of that comes from our jump, our, our tendency to jump to conclusions, to be defensive, mm. to, um, to resist the interactions we're having with others. If they say the wrong word or, or say things, we think we know what they mean. But that's right. a way of jumping to conclusions and resisting what's diff what we think is different from us too, right? I got you. Yeah, yeah. But when we practice inserting the pause, that's a choice to say, okay, wait, how do I want to respond to this? Mm -hmm. And committing to being curious enough to double checking if that what that person meant by that or what the truth of their subject is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Super so, cool. Well, and so as an example, um, you know, in, in my bio, you mentioned that I'm Inuk. And so anyone that doesn't know what that means, um, uh, Inuk, I-N-U-K, um, I am Inuk. And uh, Inuk is an individual person of the Inuit. 
So the Inuit are circumpolar coastal peoples, right? So the coastal part, nor, uh, western and northern coastal parts of Alaska and also of northern coastal Canada and Greenland. Um, so that's where the Inuit groups come from. And a, an individual Inuit person is Inuk. Mm -hmm. So one of the stories I'll tell here is I actually, as an Inuk who was born and raised in my indigenous homelands of Alaska, where my the rest of my family still reside, I actually grew up eating whale. Oh. And in fact, I um, as a kid, my favorite thing to eat was whale fat dipped in seal fat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. And so um, the truth is there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of strong reaction that I often get from people finding out I grew up eating whale. And there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about something like this, right? Because some whale species are endangered. Of course, it's not acceptable to be hunting endangered species. Um, there's a whole history, global history of over hunting whales, right? Mm -hmm. And that is deeply problematic. And at the same time, uh, the very few indigenous cultures that hunt whale, like those that I came from, uh, do it in very, very small scale in a way where they take great care every year to um, first study the whale population and ensure that taking one whale is not decimating the, that population. And then once it is taken, that meat and and blubber and skin and the bones and even the guts are all shared throughout the community and used mm. literally as sustenance that lasts not only that year, but long into the future. Oh, uh -huh. And so my, the point I'm making is that culturally, it's very easy for us to react and say, we should never hunt whales. But the survival of my peoples actually has and does depend on sustainably approached whale hunting that is only on rare occasions done, mm -hmm. but that sustains extended communities for multiple years when it is done. Right. But notice that, again, inserting a pause allows us to explore the context around what it is I'm talking about when something like that is done, right. rather than assuming, I think it's common in a lot of our cultural conversations these days, we assume if I hear this thing, it is wrong. Or if I hear that thing, it is right. When actually we can never answer if something is being done rightly or done well until we know the context around it. And so that's, again, why we have to insert the pause and commit to curiosity. Yeah. No, I. that sounds, I mean, it's just, it sounds like they were very thoughtful about what they were doing too. It wasn't just willy nilly. Yeah. But done with great care. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to make sure we actually get to um, get okay. to the line, which we're about to do. But the one last point <laughs> is to say that um, okay, we're there is this big transformation happening in how wine tasting is being done. But what I want to point out is that even if we become more aware of how we use language, right? So mm -hmm. recognizing simple things like if I claim it's an exotic spice, I'm distancing myself from that place that spice came from and the people that value it, right? Oh, uh -huh. I've mm -hmm. inadvertently pushed them away by saying that. I can, in, rather than saying, oh, this is a spice that's new to me. I don't recognize what it's called, right? Notice I'm, I'm admitting right. it's unusual, but I'm not othering it, so to speak. I'm just for admitting my own no lack of knowledge. Right. No, but for sure. It's po so anyway, my point is it's possible to be more thoughtful about our language and how we describe things, whether that's wine or otherwise, and still learn to be disciplined tasters or thoughtful tasters. I'm not talking about throwing wine tasting out the window or my certainly not my job out the window. <laughs> um, <laughs> keep it in the window. <laughs> I want to I want to keep my job. Um, but okay. I but what I am talking about is I have to sit from this bringing more thoughtfulness and um, curiosity. I really actually want to watch you dribble that wine down your face and out the side. Uh, of the okay, cool. Maybe later. Maybe if I have more. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, is... so we're gonna taste. We're gonna actually taste wine together. But do you, do you, Kevin, have any questions just about 
I kind of like wandered through all these various things together. But uh, I guess the main question. Oh, I spilled wine everywhere. Cool. I guess the main question that kind of popped to my mind was, um, like, did you have to train your palate to kind of um, understand all of the wow, this wine is delicious. All of the different things that kind of was happening and um, develop a way to take, I guess, whatever the sensation is and translate it into words that you could verbalize and express it to people? Was that something that um, kind of came naturally or did you have to work at it for a while? Um, I'm just kind of curious about that because, um, you know, yeah. I'm very new to wine, like I said. Right. Well, um, so the truth is that, yeah, it does take time and it takes practice. And, you know, as wine professionals, we say, you know, the more you taste, the easier it gets, right. you know, because it's really, you're not there's multiple things you're training. You're actually, it is possible to just drink wine and drink it because you enjoy it and, and leave it at that. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, like you just said, wow, this is delicious. Like that's literally Kevin, that's literally all you need to know. Right. <laughs> but I'm pay, I'm actually paid to write sure. or talk about wine. So I need to be able to do a little more than that though. That's still the key thing, right? <laughs> wow. This right. is delicious. So um, really it's, it's kind of wild when you think about it because you're training multiple things. So you're actually training yourself when you train to wine taste, you're training yourself to be literally more aware of what's in your mouth. Uh huh. Okay. And this experience of what's in your mouth, like what does it do to your mouth? So like I've, I, you know, I've had a couple sips of this wine. My mouth is still watering. Like the wine tasting the wine has literally changed how the inside of my mouth feels uh -huh. because there's this brightness to the wine that stimulates my whole palate. And I find that really pleasing. Right. So when I'm like, wow, I love this wine. Yes. Literally the flavors are delicious, but I'm also really enthralled with how it feels in my mouth, how the texture of the wine feels, but then how it, it's like, it lights my mouth up. Like it makes it my mouth water. Yeah. And was that something you kind of had to work towards as far as like under like I guess the uh, understanding yourself and maybe like your taste buds and your palate and then um kind of building up a a reservoir of knowledge on how to express those things? Is that does that make sense? Yeah, 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 it totally does. I think um, you know, so again, my interest in being curious meant mm -hmm. I when I realized I wanted to understand wine better, I became curious about that experience right. in the mouth. I realized, oh, that's how professional tasters, that's what they're paying attention to. Gotcha. So I started trying to study mm -hmm. what it means to taste professionally and keep learning how to pay better and better attention to that experience in, in the mouth, uh, like really importantly in the nose. Our nose and mouth are very interconnected. So mm -hmm. there's a way in which we can't smell and taste independently. So we'll talk about it as the olfactory system rather than mm -hmm. just the mouth system or the nose system. And <laughs> just the mouth system. It's I love the it. mouth system. Oh man. Steve, why didn't you make a brand for the mouth system? I think we should make t-shirts. I love my mouth system. All right. Well, <laughs> LAPL branded. <laughs> I, I gave you that. Um, okay. But I'll, um, I'll, I'll so, okay. Do you have a, do you have a cup that's I, um, I have a I have a dribble cup and I have a regular cup so we well, can because I thought Diane donated Diane her. Diane did bring it my dribble I'm gonna have some Does out of my dribble Diane's cup Diane's back there without any Diane wine? is out here do you want her to come out and have I think some Diane, wine all Diane right has done a great Diane come out and have some wine and get some wine because she has that Moscow Mule cup she could she does have it too. all right she's coming right now <laughs> okay there we go all right and then while you do that I'll I'll say what we're what we're tasting <laughs> so um. Okay. So we're really lucky in that um, really wonderful um, winemaker friends of mine that donated. They sent wine to to Kevin there at LA Public Library and also to me up here in Sonoma, um, Camines to Dreams. And it is their 2018 Zotovich Vineyard Syrah. It's located <laughs> in Santa Rita Hills, which is um, near Lompoc, really just a couple minutes from Lompoc. And that is, um, you know, Santa Rita Hills or Santa Barbara County is kind of, um, you know, there's not really vines in LA anymore. So you kind of either go out east to Temecula or you go up to Santa Barbara County. So I wanted to make sure we had a wine that's sort of um, in range of LA wine country, so to speak. Yeah, thank you to the, to the wine senders. 
really appreciate it. This is so delicious. Um, I'm going to keep dribbling into my big cup. <laughs> this is great. You, do, you don't want to opt into your um, Mount, you know, All right, fine. Well, fancy I mean, glass. guys, if you can just see the ridiculous <laughs> contraption, you know, librarian solve problems. And that's what I'm doing. I'm solving the problem of getting booze into my mouth. Well, so I want to tell you, though, you know, you very thoughtfully introduced um, today's session in relation to the um, historic, traditional and, you know, the, who's the tribal lands that they're that you're located on. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm indigenous from Alaska and Kameens to Dreams is made by a wonderful couple, uh, Tara Gomez and Maria Terebo. And um, they actually, so this is their owners and winemakers of Kameens to Dreams. And the wine is meant to express a combination of their their cultures and their and their love for wine. And um, Maria is from um, Spain, and uh, Tara is from Santa Barbara County. Tara is actually um, a member of the San Ynez Band of the Chumash, and uh, Tara and I actually met um, several years ago. And at the time. Um, I, I'm pretty sure we were each other's first other indigenous people to ever meet in wine. There aren't a lot of indi indigenous people in wine. And so for me personally, it was really very significant to meet Tara and realize um, not only was Tara Chumash, but, she, but Tara was making wine. And um, her wife, Morea, is just like one of the funnest most charming, enjoyable people and, and intelligent people to spend time with. So to get the opportunity to be with both of them really was quite a, quite, quite a gift for me. But, but Tara has now also been recognized by the California state legislature as the first native American winemaker, oh. which obviously is quite significant. Yeah. And, so cool. And, um, they selected this wine and sent it to us. And then, uh, just about two days ago, it was, um, named as um, one of the top 50 wines of 2021 by Vine Pear. One of the, it was actually named in the top 10. So um, they, I'm sure a lot of people are seeking them out trying to get this wine, but we got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's still, oh, even the cork, even the cork had a crazy, like, I little, know, I love that. I was so crazy. I haven't seen this before. I mean, I, again, I'm not a huge wine drinker, so I don't know if uh, lots of things come with stuff like that. But uh, it was impressive to me as a curious person. Well, you should pauses. also know that inadvertently Tara's roller skates match the color of the end of the. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but so Kevin, I mean, you've said that, you know, this wine is delicious and I can see that you're, you're enjoying it, but you know, other thoughts as you, as you taste it, like, and try to be just be more aware without sure. pressure just what's what appears to you uh all right i'm gonna take another sip and i'm gonna kind of i'm not gonna spit it out though i think what i'm really enjoying is just how smooth it is and uh as it enters my mouth i just um i feel like it coats it in happiness and joy mm. uh i'm not sure about uh, since i don't really have a discerning palate all i can go by is how it makes me feel and it feels really nice when it's entering my mouth. Like it, uh, I just feel like it coats it in like this really, because for me, some wines, it's very bracing um, in different ways. And this one is just so smooth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I guess, the main thing that I've noticed um, about it. And I, I guess when I'm drink, when I'm personally drinking wine, I guess I'm just focusing more on how it makes me feel rather than what I'm tasting. Um, that's just how I experience it. Um, so. I guess on a very rudimentary level, that's kind of it. You know, I'm not really sure what I'm tasting, but it's it. Um, I know it tastes good, and I know it's smooth, and uh, it's coating my mouth in happiness. So, well, I love your what you said is joy filled. You know, and then you just said coating your mouth in happiness like that. In my mind, I don't know what else we would ever need to hear. You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's delicious. Um, so I'm really I can see why it was um, so highly rated. So thanks again. This is this is delicious. All right. Uh, what about you now as the professional? Should yeah. So what? It? So um, should I smell it? Yeah. So one of the things that can be really fun about wine is that you can have a unique experience from smelling it, and then have a have another experience from tasting it. 
you know, and so sometimes, and sometimes the two experiences are very different and sometimes they really interconnect uh -huh. and, and it can just be a lot of fun. Um, one of the reasons that wine professionals use a glass like this is because it makes it easier to swirl. If you have a glass that stays very wide on the top, so mm -hmm. um, it can, when you swirl, it can <laughs> kind of <laughs> swirl right out the top, you know? Sure. Um, and if you have a collapsible camping cup, sometimes if you swirl, you can realize, oh, shoot, I was drunk and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> or it's just <laughs> leaking know? and uh, yeah. I, got, I have <laughs> a dribble leaking. glass. That yeah. too. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so the, the reason you swirl like this is because it actually releases more of the aromatics of the wine. And so it's suddenly you have this totally different kind of pleasure, which is just literally what the wine smells like. All right. I'm going to drink more so I can swirl it. Okay. And, and it's because it's good. Mm. So for me, you know, in Cal in California wine, you know, I talked earlier about how a lot of times if you're traditionally trained in wine tasting, one mm -hmm. of the first things they ask you to look for is the fruit character. And so, and then name fruit types. And then, you know, over time, then they'll say, okay, great. Now, are there any herbal notes? Are there okay. other plant types? Are there spices? Is there any sense of earthiness? You know, so, um, you know, so sometimes like in terms of plant types, people will say, oh, there's a sense of florist, forest floor. And the idea is like, if you can think about that experience of walking in the, in the woods, and there's uh -huh. leaves on the ground and the dirt is under the leaves and maybe it's just a little damp, but not too much. When you walk, there's aromas that are released by your walking, oh. which is like a combination of this soil, this mo moist, slightly moist dirt, mm -hmm. the old leaves being broken by your step. And, and, um, and, so it releases an aroma just walking through the woods releases a, an aroma and so when you're talking about oh my gosh this wine smells like forest floor that it's sort of referencing this experience of going on a walk in the woods and so one way to think about the best parts of wine tasting so if mm -hmm. you set aside the need to be professional and ah. disciplined about it in a certain way we could think of the experience of wine tasting as about learning how to be present. You know, there's this whole idea of mindfulness, right? You can be mindful of your taste experience, just like you can be mindful of the sounds and smells of walking in the woods. Oh, interesting. All right. I'm yeah. going to start to do that and just kind of <laughs> not just pour another glass just because. Is that something that you kind of employ? Is just the thoughtfulness of it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, sometimes I get really tired and I'm like, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Sure. Like, I want to want, I don't want to think about it, you know. <laughs> but um, but when I am trying to think about it or improve my tasting ability, one mm -hmm. of the things that I'll do sometimes is I'll literally go to the grocery store or the farmer's market and I'll be like, okay, let me smell some citrus. Like, let me get back to getting better at that. Oh, interesting. And you just know, and I'll just literally go things. around and I'll yeah. smell I'll smell these different fruits and there's all kinds of produce that it, it's actually a great way to figure out if it's ready to take home by literally by smelling it. Right. Uh -huh. And so, um, so on the, in that sense, the practice of honing your olfactory ability actually ties directly to picking the best foods for you too. Right. Uh -huh. So you're, so you can use wine tasting as a way to get more attuned to noticing the experience of smelling, then that can be practiced by going around smelling the foods that you're choosing to bring home too. Okay, cool. Yeah. I don't know if I'll do that, but I like No, it. I know. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you be, say to your, I want, I want to see you say, uh, Euphronia, you I got to smell, smell this. I got to smell more oranges <laughs> right now for our wine. <laughs> Diane was saying that she was tasting the spices and blueberry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Spot. Yeah, wonder. which is great. I totally get this like burst of of crunchy blueberries even. So that's one of the things that's fun too is as you oh, get yeah. you know, it's not just blueberries, it's like crunchy blueberry. Oh yeah. Now that I'm focusing on it, it's not just joy, it's also blueberries and spices. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe do, blueberries and joy are intimately that's true. connected for you. Do did you do you find it tastes differently when you spit it as opposed to like when you have to drink it? Not that much. 
Uh-huh. I would say there's this very slight difference, but but um, but not that much. And if you think about it, so if I if my job is to if I'm working as a professional taster, like let's say at a wine competition or a judging for a magazine or something like that, mm-hmm. I could be tasting anywhere from 50 to 120 wines in a day. In a day? Yeah. And so now think of it this way. If you wow. taste only one ounce okay. of 50 different wines. Oh, sure. That's 50 ounces. That's two bottles. Two full bottles. Oh, Right. So this is why we spit because uh, that sounds like a good time. I don't know. What... I, I think it sounds like a lot of crawling or just giving <laughs> up, actually. <laughs> I, uh, that, that part, too. I guess that's yeah. not the great part of wine tasting. Two um, bottles. And then uh, when you do something like that, just out of curiosity, like, is it scored on a like, what's the metric that you score things on? Well, so that totally depends on the goal. Oh, gotcha. So if you're. Um, there's lots of different ways to score. The New York Times um, does something like four stars, I think, is where they're at now. Uh-huh. Um, and um, or, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it's it might be five, but it's, you know, basically you could say out of five. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, like a solid wine would be three out of five. An excellent wine, one of the best wines in the world would be five. Right? Okay. Or a really good wine would be four. Right. Three and a half or four. Um, a wine that's like not going to kill you, but not great would be one. Right. Okay. But then um, it's really common again in the British American centered system to score out of a hundred. And, um, and part of why that works so well is because, you know, here in the States, we are used to being judged very severely by our <laughs> teachers. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, you know, from that perspective, you know, 100 is a perfect score. A 90 or above means you did really well, like you showed really good comprehension. And so in a wine context, that's going to mean it's a it's a really good wine. Like right. it's really delivering the best of what a wine can be. An 80 or up is, you know, an 80 to a 90 is fine, right? right. Um, you know, for people that are interested in learning more about this, one of the books that's really like fun and easy to read and written by one of the preeminent wine writers in, in the entire world is the 24 hour wine expert by Jancis Robinson. Um, that particular book, it, it, it gives a really great survey of all the different aspects of, of the world of wine and like gives a really good survey of like ways to think about tasting, but also just you know, different regions of the world, different types of wine, how to think about ordering off a wine list. You know, sometimes when people really want a nice wine, but the wine list can be intimidating, right? Like what is it, what do any of these weird words even mean? You know? I mean, honestly, uh, as I've been going out to dinners more um, and I think like, oh, maybe I'll have a glass of wine. And then I look at the wine list and I I have no idea how to, and then I just see a price and I just give up and I order a cocktail. Um, so maybe I should yeah. check it out. Cause I, I, I really have no idea. I, 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 I'm not even sure how to read the words sometimes. Well, absolutely. And one of the things I, that I would really encourage people to remember is that, um, you know, most restaurants, if they have a wine list, that's, you know, either full, it's not just three things that says right. red wine, white wine, <laughs> uh, you know, sure. light wine or something, but it's actually like a full page or longer. They probably have someone there oh. that has a sense of how to help you. Okay. And, and, you know, culturally, I think a lot of us are taught not to ask for help, but again, <laughs> wine's a great way to practice because oh. there, are peop- there are literally lots of people, their job is to help you pick wine. <laughs> so if you're, if you struggle with receiving good things and, right. and um, asking for help, go ahead and practice by going out to eat and, and saying, Oh, could someone help me pick a wine? Okay. You know, I will do that. And, yeah. um, and then they're going to ask you different questions like, oh, well, what kind of wine are you looking for? Well, I don't know, but, you know, I'm getting spaghetti. Do you have something that would be good with that? You know, sure. whatever. Like, don't feel like you need to know mm-hmm. what you want. They'll they'll help you. Like, that's literally their job. Right. And you had a couple of other books that you are recommending. Do you want to talk about them a little bit as well? Yeah. So, um, so if you're really wanting to know more about tasting specifically, Jancis um, wrote another book called How to Taste, A Guide to Enjoying Wine, and that gets a little more in depth 
um, just specifically on tasting. Again, you know, the 24 hour wine expert, that's a um, book that is like a really fast, fun, quick, easy read. You know, it's called a 24 hour wine expert because you can read it fast in a day. And mm -hmm. then, um, and it's kind of surveys all different aspects of thinking about wine or, or bringing wine into your life. Whereas how to taste really goes a little more in depth on tasting specifically. Mm -hmm. And then there's one other book that, um, that we mentioned that is really fun and simple and gets into, um, it's like a very, you know, more recently written and is meant to be really approachable and fun and, and, and uh, enjoyable for people, whether they're wine experts or not. And that's called Wine Simple, a totally approachable guide from a world-class sommelier by Aldo Som. And so Aldo Som is uh, for wine people, wine people that work in the profession. Aldo Som is literally one of the uh, world's uh, most respected sommeliers. He's um, worked in top restaurants around the world. And this book is really fun because it's um, really tries to rethink some of the language uh, that we have for wine and some of the things that that have been part of the tradition, kind of like what we were talking about earlier. And so it approaches things by writing about wine, but also being um, a little bit visual, having some pretty great in, um, infographics along the way too. So, so that's, again, an uh, overview book. Um, there is a section on wine tasting, but if you're curious about wine more generally and different types of wine from around the world, Wine Simple is a, a great one to look for. Okay, cool. Um, I had a couple questions that are random. So, uh, you know, and if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat. Um, and Elaine will do her best to answer them. All right. Uh, the most surprising thing about being a wine reviewer that people may not know. Oh, um, uh, my goodness. Um, I guess for me, it's, um, for me, like it's been, it has been this real lesson in paying attention. Um, mm. because the truth is like, I think, I think if we're not paying attention, it's really easy to get into this practice of reviewing wine and thinking, oh, it's just a bottle. Like, well, you know, this oh, uh -huh. is, it's just a bottle of wine. But you know what? Actually, Tara and Maria made this wine. And the Zotafitch family grew this wine. And when you put that reminder in there, this wine connects to a whole culture of and, and work life that exists in Santa Barbara County and like, you know, Tara and Maria have devoted their lives to this work, right? And the Zotovich family have devoted their lives to growing the fruit that's made Kameens to Dreams possible too. And for me, that means I have a profound responsibility in thinking about wine, reviewing wine. And it's, I, I wanna be careful here to make sure people understand. I don't mean that I should only say good things. Gotcha. I mean that I should do the work to make sure I mean what I say. And again, I think this goes back to all of us can think a little bit more about how we talk with each other, how we, what, what, what the words we use imply about what we mean Yeah. yeah. and, and inserting the pause to take the time to think and, and especially take the time to listen. Right. That's cool. Um, is there a wrong way to drink wine? It would be really hard to like take a bottle and like be standing on your head and drink it upside down because it would like probably come out your nose. <laughs> so upside down is the wrong way. Yeah, it would. It would be hard. It would be hard if somebody pulls that off and posts a video. Be sure to tag me. But uh, but I think it would not morally wrong, but yeah, challenging. Hard, but not impossible. Yeah. But also strange. Yeah. Like, why yeah. would you do that? I suppose but if you had a like a curly straw and we're upside down. <laughs> Maybe you could pull that off. <laughs> um, all right. So, you know, the movie sideways, I mean, yes, I'm sure you're familiar I, I with do, it. Yes. Are there any other films or TV shows that depict wine culture in particularly interesting ways? This or is a really difficult question because <laughs> A lot because a lot of times what happens is wine movies or movies with wine end up being factually inaccurate. Oh, <laughs> you know, and so as a wine professional, it's really difficult to watch them. 
Gotcha. Um, but I, but that said, um, in terms of food and wine together, Babette's Feast is such a beautiful film. It's, um, re- you know, uh, it's Zach Denison uh, wrote what the movie is based off of. And, um, and it's, uh, I think it's Finland um, that it occurs in. I think oh, that's it's, right. It's a, for- it's a foreign film. Yes. It's a foreign film um, where there's this, just this incredibly beautiful scene like that's centered entirely around the idea of a meal. And oh. um, that is the culmination of the movie. And, um, but re- ultimately uh, the movie is showing how food and the marriage of food with wine, like the experience of a meal is really an expression of devotion and care and art- artistic creativity. And so for me personally, like I, that's, that really means a lot to me because, because I think we get to choose what we do and we get to choose how we do it. And in a sense, those two choices, what we do and how we do it are far more important than the literal thing itself. You know, I chose to work in wine, right? but for me, how, how I work in wine, how I interact with others, wine is an opportunity for me to practice devotion and service and care and thoughtfulness. Yeah. It just happens to be done through wine. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, cool. That's... And then that feast ends up expressing that for me. Yeah. That's cool. Um, okay. D- uh, does the glass, does the kind of glass you drink wine out of affect the taste? It totally does. It turns out if your glass is dribbling all over your desk, it's really hard to pay attention. <laughs> what if it's a plastic mini cup that is spilling? Does that affect my taste as well? <laughs> it does because you're distracted okay, from ha, ha, tasting ha. the wine. But that no, but actually it, as, as surprising as it is, uh-huh. the shape of the glass really does change the experience of the wine. But, but perhaps more interestingly, we've learned in the last 10 years that other things also affect the f- taste of wine. So um, a lot of studies have been done showing that the sounds that we hear when we're tasting completely <clears throat> transform our experience of the taste. And, um, and so there's literally like extensive studies done on sensory perce- perception that show that what we hear when we're uh-huh. tasting completely changes our experience of, of the wine. And so like, as an example, another colleague of mine, Susan Lynn, she, um, she and I were just at this event I mentioned earlier, and her work was literally showing that when people are listening to music, mm-hmm. it completely transforms the experience of the wine. What's really surprising is that the way the music transforms the experience is consistent across all people, regardless of cultural background. Oh, crazy. It's like a human thing. It's a human thing. Yeah. And so she did a study that um, she had, she presented people with five wines. Mm -hmm. One of them was tasted silently and the next (laughs) four were tasted each with a different type of music. Uh And the way that one type of music changed the, or, you know, affected the perception of the wine that was consistent across all who tasted what they um, what they discovered in the end was that it was actually five glasses of the same wine. Oh, <laughs> but that the impact of the music sure. was so, so thorough that most people couldn't tell at all of all the um, of over 80 people that did this. Only one person could tell that it was the same wine. And even he said only because he was thinking that must be the trick. Oh, Not crazy. Because yeah. he still, he said they tasted completely like five different wines. The big insight though, from one of the big insights from her study was that even if people disliked the music, mm-hmm. every single person liked wine better if there was music playing. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Just like when um the presentation of a food, how you see something also affects how you taste it. So it's yeah, interesting to yeah. think like how you uh, hearing something will also affect your uh, ability to enjoy the wine in different ways. So yeah, that's really cool. I didn't, well, I'm saying learning something new. Yeah. We're just, we're discovering that our senses are all far more intertwined than, than we'd been realizing before. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're up to our hour. It's, it's already flown by already. I had so many more good questions. 
uh, Steve wasn't going to let me ask them. So I'll ask them off camera, but uh, they, they were good. They were really good. So um, <laughs> uh, I want to be sure, though, to thank again. Thank you. Yeah, to, this was uh, so good. Maria and Tara Camines to Dreams. Um, this wine is actually still available through their website. Um, yeah. For the wine geeks out there, uh, this is 20% whole cluster, 2018 vintage from Zodovich Vineyards. 2017 was the first year they made wine under this label. Um, it is 80% uh, neutral barrel, which wine geeks will know what that means. And um, <laughs> and uh, from the kind of sandy slopes of Highway 246 in uh, Santa Rita Hills. All right. Elaine, this was so fun. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope people got... Um, a lot out of it. I know I did. I mean, at least I got a, a dribble glass of wine and a regular glass, thanks to my boss. So yeah. um, thank you so much again. We'd love to have you back sometime. And, thank you. Uh, yeah, It'd really be fun to come back with, you know, a couple other wine people and just and chat that way. Yeah, too. we're hoping to make that happen. So uh, cool. stay tuned, everybody. Well, so. and um, I'm happy to help you drink on the job. So um, uh, so I'm welcome. I'm happy for you to help me do that as well. So <laughs> okay. appreciations all around. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate Thank you. It. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. That was super fun. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's LA May program. And remember to check out the library's online calendar at lapl.org slash events. And don't forget to check out our next amazing LA May program, on Thursday, December 2nd at 4 p.m., where, we'll, where we will be spotlighting Vendores de Acción, Vendors in Action. During this special LA May program, we will spotlight the 2021 short film Vendedores en Acción. <coughs> uh, that's the title, sorry. While many Angelinos know and depend on street vendors, this documentary highlights the economic and emotional difficulties street vendors face in our city, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. For this program, we will screen Vendores de Acción and then have a conversation with director Alvaro Parra and one of the street vendors profiled in the film. Finally, our winter reading challenge is right around the corner. Join the winter reading challenge and let a book charm, intrigue, or transport you. Register and track your progress online or on the Beanstack Tracker app. Pick up a game board at any of the Los Angeles Public Library's 72 locations. Complete five activities and be entered into a drawing to win a prize from the library store. This reading challenge will start on December 6th and go on until January 8th, 2022. So until next time, we truly appreciate all your support. We really do. The success of LA Made and all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you and have a great night.